That's not why you're here. You're here because Richard's here, and Richard is responsible for you know K3, which was the big table that we debuted last year, and and now K5. And so I was thinking. We did a talk yesterday, and I was thinking about uh, time, because we kept we kept talking about uh, time yesterday, and I thought maybe we'd make that the the um, the thing for today. And so I, I'm going to throw this one out, out for you. Tell me if this is all right. So Todd, um, time is, is in, a, in a certain sense, why we made this turntable, mm -hmm. the time domain accuracy. But this table, you know, it's got, we got nine years. We've nine. got 1,100 hours. Programming. And we got 20 minutes. Okay. All right. Do you know where I'm going with this? Be quick. Okay. So, you know, Richard and I, we met Virtually, virtually, yeah. I, got a, I got a phone call from this person from the other side of the world. Hi, I'm Jonathan Weiss. I want you to build me a turntable. That's the Reader's Digest version of the conversation. And I said, who are you? So I'm Googling Jonathan while I'm talking to him. And Jonathan basic, basically said, build me the best turntable you can possibly make. Okay. And I don't care what it costs. Now, how can you? I didn't say that, but yes, he did. No, it's so, true. We didn't compromise. Yeah. How can you turn down a, 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 an offer like that? So, time. A, a, a turntable is a is an impossible engineering problem, but which is why it's so fascinating. And to to describe what a turntable needs to do, it's quite simple actually. It needs to go at a constant speed, but it needs to go at a constant speed relative to the cartridge. That means that if you do a thought experiment, and let, let's say you assume that 33 and a third, perfectly 33 and a third, is stationary, then any deviation from 33 and a third is movement, okay, which changes the time. And also, if you've got any movement in the bearing, if you've got any movement in the chassis and the arm board and the, and the bearings and the arm itself, that's movement, which, which the, the turntable and the cartridge will represent as a change in speed. So a turntable needs to go at a constant speed, but not just the platter. The whole turntable needs to go at a constant speed. And this is a, when you turn it on its head like that, you rethink the way a turntable is built. And actually what you do is you make a turntable that's built like a cutting lathe. They knew about it then. Uh, and if this resembles a cutting lathe. Um, to make it have a constant speed, to make it be still, this chassis is, it looks very simple, but inside that chassis is a very complex matrix of galleries which are filled with oil and a particulate. And if you listen to the sound, that's the sound the chassis makes. The, cha the chassis is approaching um, uh, critically damped. And I, I assume you understand what critically damped means. It's very, very still. No, actually, cri critical damping is something that needs to, okay. to just be quickly discussed because even I didn't have a proper understanding okay. of critical damping. And, and this is a huge deal because when it comes to racks, when it comes to turntable isolation, when it comes to lots of things in audio, you'll see claims about, about damping and you'll, then you'll hear the reality yep. and, they're, and they're very divergent and things can get over damped very easily. Absolutely. And so what is what is over damped, under damped versus critically damped really mean? Critically. And in the context of this. In the context of this, critically everything resonates, you can't stop that. But you can dampen you can dampen that resonance. So with critical damping, what you want to do is to stop it from ringing at the shortest in the shortest possible time. That's critically damped. If you take a long time to stop it from ringing, that's over damped. Sorry. Yes, over damp, and under damp rather, other way around. And if you take a too short a time, then it rings. And so we want that, that sound, that is critical damping. And that means that I've provided in this case Frank with his beautiful arm, a very, very still platform for his arm to sit on. So his arm has a better job, easier job of tracing the record. And the other thing which, which in my opinion, Turntable design is a mistake that they make, and it's my opinion, only my opinion, they have their opinions, is that there should be nothing soft around the loop. 
everything that you have in this loop from the, 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 the mat all the way around back to the cartridge again should be a hard material. And that means that um, when we launched K3, there was a lot of talk online about um, why hasn't it got vacuum hold down? Uh, yeah, vacuum hold down, that's a huge one because um, vacuum hold down became a thing at a certain point in the history of, of high-end decks. Um, it, I think, historically, I think it happened when a certain Asian people bought uh, cutting lathes and brought them to Japan, and they got very high marks. Mm -hmm. And the only thing as a belt drive manufacturer that you could bring in from the cutting lathe was, was vacuum. vacuum hold down. So that was a great way to market, to flog a much more expensive sure. deck, um, it was by offering the vacuum hold down. So. so people say K3 is a very expensive turntable, why hasn't it got vacuum hold down? Because cutting lathes have vacuum hold down, so why hasn't K3 got vacuum hold down? And the reason that K3 doesn't have vacuum hold down, it was a decision I made very early on, I had funds to do it, was that you need soft seals. You need soft seal on the outer circumference of the record and where the label goes. And in my experience, putting something soft against a record is right. just, you don't do it. You don't do it. So then they say, well, but cutting lathes have vacuum hold down and, and they have soft seals. No, they don't. The lacquer, the underside of a lacquer is perfectly smooth. It sits on the platter and is sucked down to the platter. There is no soft seals in the cutting lathe. But you are forced to have soft seals on a record because the record is not necessarily flat and its contour is Right, so, you know, because I have a lot of friends who are cutting engineers and, uh, you know, uh, a lacquer has a metal underside for one thing. But another thing is, you know, what is a cutting lathe doing? It, it's this huge, massive arm, right, with a heated stylus is digging, literally, you know, digging a, manually a group. Of course, there's a, you need that vacuum hold down to keep that whole system still. That is not what we're doing playing a record. So the whole vacuum hold down thing mm. really just doesn't make it. No. Not as an engineering argument and not either as a, you know, a, an acoustic argument to myself. Also, you know, we haven't, we didn't talk about this, but the system that Richard developed for both K3 and K5 involved this uh, th this washer, which, how many? 23. 23 different materials and sizes. And sizes. So that, go, can you explain that while I put this away? How that works? Reflex, this is a reflex clamp. Uh, it's, it's not my idea, um, but I, I think this is quite advanced reflex clamp. You, you push the center of the record up above the plat above the mat surface, and then you put the reflex clamp on and push it down and then you do it up and the collet pulls the clamp down. It's, it's concave. Onto the record. You can see this concave it's, surface. It's so, so you get very good contact all the way across the record. Approximating what you get forcing with... forcing the record it down. Is. You can feel it flex and you can feel the, the tension. So the record is not it really, really affirmatively uh, placed against the graphite, the, the crystalline graphite mat, which we also make. Sure. So the record becomes one with the platter. Um, back to speed, it's a direct drive and the, the, the direct drive motor in here is, is it breaks all the rules, all the apparent rules for, for a direct drive turntable. On, I haven't measured this one yet because we haven't had time, but with K3, the frequency response of the drive is 70 hertz. K3's platter weighs 13 kilograms, so to put that in perspective, if the motor in K3 was driving a subwoofer and the diaphragm in the subwoofer weighed 13 kilograms, its 3 dB, 3 dB upper drop-off point would be 70 hertz. It gives you an idea of how powerful the motor in K3 is. This is a little less powerful, but it's still a very, very powerful motor. If you want to make something go at a constant speed, you must really hold it tight. And we have a very, very powerful motor to do that. And then you spend 1,100 hours. So you, so you have the iron fist, which is the motor, and then you spend 1,100 hours putting a Let's just talk about glove. So direct drive turntables have had um, a bad rap in part because the speed controls were either too loose 
or because or too tight. Too aggressive. Too aggressive. When they're too aggressive, it sort of bleaches the sound. Yeah. And it's it's and, and we're talking about stuff that's technically um, a lot of scientists or engineers would say you can't hear this, but of course everybody in this room, you're here, everybody in this room would would be able to hear it, right? And, and we could hear the difference, you know, you can hear the difference between all the decks, you can hear the difference between all the Japanese super mm -hmm. decks. They all had cogging motors. Correct. This zero, doesn't. zero cogging. And e both K3 and K5 have no poles, they are zero cogging motors. They use the most advanced motor on the planet. How long did it take us to find the motor? Well, it's not, we didn't actually buy a motor, we, we, we took us yeah, six months, it, it, took, it took us six months searching, and we found two possible assemblies which we could make into a motor. The first one we, we bought, it didn't meet specifications. The second one is, is what's in here and in and K3. And what I said to Jonathan, we didn't buy a motor because the, the two parts we got were just the stator and the rotor. We still needed the shaft, we still needed the housing. The chassis, the, the plinth, is the housing of the motor. So this comes, this talks right back to keeping things still. If you've got something that's controlling the platter, you want it to be intimately coupled to the chassis. The best way to do that is to have the chassis as the motor housing itself. It's no separate, if you pull this apart, you can't take out a working motor. Um, we, so, so we made the entire platter bearing assembly is the motor, and we made that. We make that. But the motor ports are literally, it's the most advanced motor on the planet. Sure. It, it, you know, they so, so we turned this thing, turned K3 on, and it's got an auto-tune function. And the control, the controller, which is here, is insanely advanced as well. It has an auto-tune function, and it, it uh, made the turntable work. And so it's going around, and we listened to it, and then we thought, we can make this better. 1,100 hours of programming time, we had it a lot better than the auto-tune function. And the, the, the process was simple, and we did it almost every night for, for 18 months or so. Was um, the, 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 We had a listening panel, and we had a programmer who was uh, doing that, and he would um, make a change, and the question was the same every time. Better, worse, same. Sometimes he, sometimes he would pretend to make a change and not make a change. And we had to listen so to these double changes. Blind. Double blind. Um, and we, we would say, yes, it's better, or no, it's not better. And we did this again and again and again and again, thousands of times. And we just drove down the, 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 the speed, improved the speed stability down to insanely, almost incomprehensibly low levels. I, where I, I talk about it as being almost molecular dimensions of time. But how, how, how low? An arc second. An arc second is 1 60th of an arc minute, 60th of an arc minute, which is 1 60th of a second, so there's 1.29 million arc seconds in a circle. We are adjusting the controller to how it drives the motor down to arc seconds. So let, let's just take a moment. What Richard is saying is that, I mean, they were you were measuring We this, could measure it as well. But, you know, through, through, through listening, you found, without being cognizant of, of it, that you were uh, hearing uh, differentiation at the scale of millions of a second. Correct. Which is very interesting because, you know, science, and where it relates to audio, the science of, of, of here, you know, psychoacoustics, has uh, over the last 50 years, you know, said human hearing is only good till 20K, 20,000 hertz, right? That was the argument for CDs and digital to be better and to limit what the bandwidth was of, mm. of, of digital and CDs, right? Then that lasted for a really long time. If you said, well, you know, you, you can censor, that may be technically true, but it's not true, you were not allowed at the table. Nobody took you seriously. Right. I, I wrote a blog entry already, I think now six or seven years ago, there was a scientific study at Rockefeller Institute in New York that showed that the, F, the Fourier transform was not correct, that hearing, human hearing is not linear, and that we can hear, well, we can sense up to 100,000 times a second, and the entire model of what is possible for hearing was wrong, human hearing. And what, what you see if you, over the course of the 20th century, is that 
where what we're supposed to be able to hear in the time domain just keeps getting bumped up, right? But we kind of know that empirically from our listening that things that you know maybe we're not supposed to hear we do hear, and then we make changes accordingly. And and and, and we would. So we had the, the core listening panel, and then every month or so we would bring another group of people and, and say, what do you think? Every single time they said, you've improved the speed stability. Now we started at 0.01% WRMS, we're on Flutter, and we drove it down from there. And, and th so this was in month increments, they're coming in and listening to that. It was, it was actually, it was an eye-opener for me. I didn't, because you kind of get sucked into the 20 to 20 thing. Um, but yeah, you can hear it. And, and, and the other interesting thing was there was virtually no dissension on good, better, uh, worse. No, which, sorry, same, worse, better. There was virtually no dissension at all with the listening panel. We agreed una almost unanimously every time, which is quite remarkable. So one of the reasons that I, I really felt very strongly about engaging in this project um, was that you know, what we're doing it, from the larger perspective with OMA, with, with the speakers and then with the electronics to drive the speakers, is, is to improve the time accuracy in, in, the, in the, the loudspeaker domain, right? What you're hearing. So that a transient, mm. the transient response is, is accurate to what we know from real life. And audio, high-end audio, has diverged from that massively to the point that time domain accuracy almost doesn't matter. But if you really are serious about it, you, you're going to be looking for a source that's the most accurate yep. source. So, you know, if people ask, like, why are you, you're a loudspeaker company. I mean, I think that's most, how most people would associate OMA if they said <coughs> loudspeaker company. That also makes the electronics. And we, we've done that from the beginning for a very simple reason that, you know, uh, 100 to 500 watt amp doesn't make sense with a, a speaker that's only going to eat one or two watts for the most part, right? But having this, a supremely accurate reproducer mm -hmm. shows and allows the whole thing to go where you want it to go, which is that startling, lifelike feeling that you get when you know when you're in front of a really great system. You go, like, whoa. And you don't know, you, know, you don't have to think or know why. But I can tell you that really good time domain accuracy is one of the big reasons why. Much more important than fidelity on the frequency. Not that frequency response doesn't matter. Of course it does. But you, your brain will, will correct for that real quick. Your brain does not correct for it. Anything wrong with time, that's, that's it. Done. I, I assume most of you have heard what this, this does. And, and it has a... I'm, okay. It's my child, um, but it, it has this presence, this 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 dynamic drive that doesn't hinder the music. It enhances the music, and it's I just find that revealing. And the the other thing when we were doing these these A B A B A test A B testing was we also started saying how does it make us feel, and it got to the point where we, regularly we had people doing the testing. And they've, they've listened to this record now hundreds of times. They're bursting into tears while they're listening to it. And that, isn't that what it's all about, really, is to get in, get inside. And that's, that's It wasn't because you, Nathan listened to it <laughs> no. one last time. It just put no, I it. can't take all it. Right, all right, sorry. So um, I think we did nine years we've known each other. It was seven years to K3 and an additional two for K5. That's not nine years of us, t like, oh, you remember no. that turntable project? It's nine years. It's on the front burner. The, this was, or K3 in particular, was uh, I, not my day job. It was everything else. Day job, K3, for seven years. If I'm awake, I'm thinking about K3. Actually, so uh, Rich's day job is he owns an important hydraulics design and, and manufacturing company with a lot of people down in, in New Zealand. Um, th this looks very simple from the outside. What's inside? A and lot. how does that relate to? Uh, as, as we said, it's, uh, it's, it's, the inspiration for what's inside came from um, 
hydraulic manifolds which we make in New Zealand. And a hydraulic manifold is either a piece of aluminium or a piece of cast iron which has galleries drilled into it which are effectively the electrical equivalent of wires for pathways for the oil to flow and then you put in hydraulic valves to control an oil circuit. And you can get very, very complex hydraulic circuits by doing it that way. So inside here, it's very, very busy. You can't see that, but it's very, very busy with galleries of different sizes, different shapes, different intersection angles, deliberately done that way to get this critical dampening. And then those galleries are filled with, with oil and a particulate. <laughs> it takes a very long time for the oil to, to infuse into, into there, three days to get the oil in there. You just dribble it in very slowly and then it slowly seeks through everything and goes through all of these galleries and eventually it comes out of the two, two ports at the back and so you know it's full. Three days. It takes five days to assemble that platter. It's not a sim it does not look simple. It takes five days. Five hours. That has oil in it. And, and the, the, sili the silica particles. Five hours to assemble this. After it's machined, I get it from our, we, we make this and I get it, and it takes me five hours to put this together. These are complex machines on the inside, but on the outside, they are beautifully and simple. simple. Um, but if you know what cutting lathes look like, whether pre-war, universal lathes, for example, I have one of those in the collection, or, you know, Scully Neumann lathes, you recognize this. It's a cutting lathe. Um, and, you know, it's a, a very precise industrial machine tool and at the same time a scientific grade instrument. Um, we kept it very, this one, very simple. And even the, the machine, machining stripes, that there, this is a funny story because he sends me a picture. It, this had just come out of his machine shop. And I'm looking at the machining and how incredibly beautiful the, the, the work was done. And I'm saying, that's it. I, I, was, I, I was going to get it sandblasted. Yeah. I, I, I like old watches. And, you know, if you open up old watches, you'll see all these turning marks and Geneva stripes. And that was done on really the top watches. You'll never see those elements unless you open. Who's going to open up their watch back? Well, you know, you don't do that. But I, I get it, like, what's involved. So... What you're seeing there is not decoration. That's simply evidence of the industrial process at the highest level that was used to make this thing. There's not much besides these three lines and our logo. This is a very, very simple design. Now, K3 was a little, you know, I, I call a lot of flack for how K3 looked. I still, I still really like it, but th this is much much simpler, but the, if anybody's wondering about why it looks, why it's the finish it does, this is the finish as it comes off of, out of the CNC machine. My machine has complained that Jonathan left it like that because they consider it, you failed if you get these machine marks. I think it's beautiful actually, I think it's yeah. beautiful. One, one more aspect too, to both K3 and K5, there's a lot of machinery inside here. Um, and we, 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 we would do resonance tests of the, the chassis and then we'd add, say, the, 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 the motor stator and we'd, we'd do a resonance test again. The motor stator's got a clamping mechanism which holds it in place. We'd do a test again and the, and the rule there was do no harm when you add something. And so we had to redesign the, the clamp which holds the stator in place three times because the first one we did when we did the resonance test, it, the resonance was worse. And the only thing we changed was this clamp. So we, we went, went through three versions before we got to the one that's inside here and inside K3. The arm board is a, is a structural member of this turntable. It's not just an arm board. And when you bolt the arm board down and you do a resonance test, the chassis is closer to critical damped because of the arm board. So all the parts that we bolted onto it outside and inside improved its performance, its resonance performance, as well as having a function, obviously, measuring the speed or uh, holding the stator in place. So, you know, um, I, I just like to point out, since we're, we're making and selling this, right, that, you know, some takeaways here are that this industrial design is, is an extremely simple and honest design 
that actually hides all a huge amount of work and complexity and expense inside, but you don't know that, as opposed to another approach, which is to design something that is that got tons of complexity or is way larger than maybe it needs to be. I mean, Americans invented that with our SUVs and our ridiculous homes. But, uh, you know, this oversized, super complicated thing that's really impressive, but it's not. And then there's this approach, which is understated and, and elegant and sort of hiding actually where the money is. Because mm -hmm. the money is in, in there and in, in that time and effort it took to do that. Um, so that, that's, uh, I think, a, a, an important thing when you, because we, we I, th I think there's been a lot of discussion about why are these things looking so different from the other offerings out there, right? And I'm, I'm trying to think, well, they go back to the, because the, I, I said, I, when we discussed the inspiration for this, mm. the, that the cutting lathe we was talked about that a the lot. inspiration of this. The other thing is, you know, the motor is the, the real core of this, and you know, you explained how we built that motor mm. from scratch. Look around and, and ask yourself at the uh, at this level of turntables, where the motors came from. Yeah, what is, what's the provenance? I'm not going to go into it because you know what I'm talking mm. about. So, um, so we got we got the nine years, we got the 1100 hours, we got the 20 minutes because that's how long it <laughs> took. Well, are we, are we, are we 20 minutes to <laughs> fill this, like a, a thimble of oil, right? That was 20 minutes. Because you said your wife hates me because Yeah, was, um, she does. So <laughs> I, I was interrupting the family. Fortunately, she's in New Zealand, so I have a chance. Um, Frank Schroeder's not in the room, uh, but he designed the, uh, the arm for this. And he's been integral to the, to the process because he obviously designed a K3 arm. Richard, what else would you like to talk about since we have a few more minutes on this thing? Okay, let's let's look at let's talk about the platter on this and in K3. The, the, the K3 platter, you may have seen photos of that. There's some photos down the back there. The K3, the K3 also has oil galleries in it, in the, in, the, in, the, in the platter, and that's why it takes. That's one of the reasons it takes five weeks to build a K3 platter. This one doesn't. Um, that doesn't mean that we, we've we've dumbed it down a lot. It's still very, very extensively engineered. It con uses constrained layer dampening underneath here. It uses a, a felt ring which is infused with a material that, that dampens it. The mat itself makes a, makes a very, very positive effect on the platter. And when Jonathan asked me, we, we did a sketch and the, the sketch had this rebate in the platter and, and I threw up my arms in horror. <laughs> and we had a phone call about this. Yeah. And, and I said, Jonathan, what are you doing to me? You're, just, you're making my life harder. It turns out, the beautiful irony, that this step on the platter actually helps its resonance. I thought it would hinder it. But I knew it actually, that, but actually, I just didn't want to oh, throw my right, around. Right, right. Um, and so that, that step, and so that, the, the idea was to get the arm board going underneath the platter. Um, but yeah, that, that step actually improves the performance of the platter, okay. which is a lovely thing. Uh, so, um, how about some, I'm sure there's some questions, right? And, you know, Richard is coming a long way. I don't think he's going to necessarily be at Munich every year. Uh, anybody have any questions? I, I still have... You were talking about hydraulics. Yep. And my father came with an idea of using, instead of electric motor, some kind of hydraulic control yeah. flow. I, I, one, of my, one of my dreams was a hydraulically driven um, turntable. Yes, and it's, it's perfectly possible, but we, what we want, and, and, and you, a, a torque converter in a car is, a, is the same, um, but we need very, very regulated control of the speed, down to arc seconds, and so that means that the motor needs to be able to respond at, at that frequency, the controller needs to be able to sense the, at that frequency. You can do that with hydraulics, and, and it will go around at 33 and a third on average, but that's not, we're not what we're inter interested in. We're interested in going around 33 and a third precisely while it's playing music. And, and it's interesting too when, when people measure the speed of turntables. Do they do it playing music? Most of the time not. This, the controller which is in here, the computer, it can measure its own, measure the speed. So we can, we can download the speed information and we can do that whilst playing music. 
and to see what that's what really matters, right? You don't listen to a, a, a constant well, tone. I mean, I'd like to bring up the fact that I, I we we gave this to Stereophile for review, and you know, very famous reviewer, you know, had this uh, you know, very low grade speed testing app, you know, that measured average speed. And you know, this was great for his purposes because all the turntables basically measured the same with a little bit of difference. So you know how the, all the magazines work. Everything is like, it's a little better with this, but when I played this, it was, the bass was a little weaker. And then this was a little, it's like. You know, I'm, it's I'm going to give away, I'm going to give away one, sorry. Yeah. One secret. We measure the speed of this platter 1.34 million times per revolution. No other turntable does that. So, you know, average speed is not important. It's the, and that's, that's just because people constantly come to me at, at our, our place in New York and, and they, they would say, well, this belt drive thing. Um, so let's just get that taken yeah, care let's of do here. That. Uh, you know, belt drive turntable and those measurements, that they're, they're meant for each other mm -hmm. because the whole belt drive universe that, that technology, that philosophy is about maintaining average speed. But that's not what your ear hears. What your ear hears is when, when you, you know, have a transient and it slows the, the platter sure. down and the, the, the belt can't catch. Well, you, you talk about it. It's, it's, it's interesting that, and again, this is my opinion and I don't want to... <coughs> anyway, you, you see turntables with heavier and heavier platters with a bit of dental floss driving the the platter or something. Mm -hmm. To me, that is just the wrong way to go. You have to be able to get the energy back into the platter, which the cartridge is taking out. This is just a simple physics equation. Conservation of momentum. When you're playing your record, you are constantly dragging energy out of the platter all the time. And, you, and it's not regular. It, it's to do with the music, obviously. And so you need to be able to put it straight back in again, in real time. Now, if you've got a heavy platter spinning and over here you've got a motor driving a, a thread or a, a belt, you have compliance between the two. You have a time constant between the two. This motor cannot get the platter up to speed straight away because it has to stretch the belt or put a bit of tension on the, on the thread. How can you possibly maintain constant speed if you're doing that under a dynamic load? How can you do that? It just, to me, it doesn't make sense doing it that way. The only way to do it is direct drive. And even with a direct drive, you still need to have feedback, you still need to measure speed because this is a synchronous motor, it will go at 30, if, if we just told it to go at 33 and a third, it would go at 33 and a third, on average. But when you change the load, the, the motor will move backwards and forwards in phase. You must have a small phase angle between the rotating field and the, and the rotor. If you haven't got a phase angle, they've got no torque. If you increase the torque, that phase angle increases. Therefore, the platter slows down momentarily. So you need to put, you need to put feedback around it. Thank you, sir. <laughs> you need to put feedback, but it doesn't hunt. If you use, if you use um, and that's what we were driving out with a PID controller. We were, we were driving out the hunting, because you to start with it did this, and uh, we, we were driving out that hunting effect, and that was one of the things that we were so, so critical for. The motor is a completely different motor than's ever been used on any direct drive or any, any turntable, or any direct drive turntable. And the controller. And then the controller is not doing this hunting and pecking thing that all the previous, and even mm. the techniques, SB10R, which I, we make a point for this, great yeah. for the, it's an amazing value proposition, that turntable. But it's still doing that. This is working differently, and hopefully, you know, when you listen to it, you, you say, oh, well, I, I can hear that. There's an interesting story about the controller. Um, I also spent six months trying to find a suitable controller, um, and this one is spectacular in what it can do. The manual has 294 pages, and is written by people who know how it works for people who know how it works. And I didn't know how it worked. <laughs> um, and so when we first tried to make the, the turntable go, the platter's going backwards and forwards and speeding up and slowing down. It took us a very long time to understand yeah. how the controller works. And there, is, there are thousands of parameters that you can adjust. 
and you adjust one parameter and that talks to another parameter. So you have to go backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. forwards. And you just, just fine it right down until you get to the level that we're hearing here. So th this motor is actually, the, 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 the gyroscopes that control the anti-ballistic missile Correct. system for the US military use this exact motor. So does the most expensive Dutch chip making machine. Correct. Uses this motor. The cheapest thing that uses this motor, besides us, is $80 million. It's a, one of these chip-making mm -hmm. machines. So th that's the level. When I don't know if you remember, this is already a few years ago when we had that, that big phone call, that collective phone yep. call. Yes. The head of the motor company, because <laughs> it's very funny, like, we're so tiny, we, we're like just a speck, you know, on, on the, 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 the landscape of the companies mm -hmm. that make these things. But when they find out that you're using it to make a turntable, suddenly you get a lot of attention. Yep. So the head of the company that, who's one of the world's most famous speed control, teaches speed, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in a very famous engineering university in the United States. We all got on the, on the, on the phone, and the, the question pretty quickly was like, how the fuck did you do that? Yeah. Because they knew that we didn't have the, the lab, the, the multi-million dollar, I mean, like $10 million of dollar laboratory with the tools that they have, that how were you able to get, and they, they just couldn't, it was great. We did it in a small workshop in New Zealand. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? I guess I gotta find a good record to play, right? Another? Just a second one. Yeah. What about outer rim? Do you have a plan? What about? The outer uh, rim. Ah. You mean a, 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 a clamp on the outside? The, the reflex clamp does that. I'm, I'm, I, I, I understand the principle and, 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 and I agree that they're potentially they're superior, but I don't want to wipe that thing out. You have to, you have to draw the line. Okay, and but the reflex clamp, if, if, you, if you observe the, the, the action, as you apply vertical pressure to the clamp, first off, the outer edge of the record contacts the mat, and then it's driven flat. So you are getting, you are getting um, contact, good contact, right out the very circumference of the platter. Uh, the phono stage. The phono stage is the OMA PD2 <coughs> phono stage. And the, the, the engineer and designer of that, who never comes to these things, will be here tomorrow, if everything turns out properly from Holland. So. Might. You might have a chance to, to chat with him. Thank um, you. Yeah. Thank you.